Good morning, you're watching Hornbill TV and today we have a special newsroom coverage, a discussion where we discuss on the, the big topics of our Naga society. Gone are the days when Nagas were known solely for head hunting and raiding other villages. Today we speak of education and employment, which is the new race that we need to conquer. A dormant, yet a matter of high concern in our developing society. Employment. Today, we'll have an in-depth conversation with our senior journalist and associate editor, Mr. Al Moli, on the issue of our very own youths seeking jobs outside the state, which as we may not realize is an alarming issue with the literacy rate going up we have more challenges building up employment within the state why are our young minds not in the state but working outside why are they educated in pursuance of jobs somewhere else is the government at fault is the system at fault let's discuss all these issues today on a special exclusive and shed light on the situation that we have in our hands. Hello, Mr. L. Yeah, Lee, I yeah. can hear you. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, Mr. L, uh, I would like to discuss uh, on this very topic and uh, I would like your input on the topic saying that recently we had a very big situation at hand where even the government of Nagaland had to intervene where so many youths of Nagaland were caught doing illegal stuff in Gurgaon, in the call centers. Why are our youths going out of the state and involving in such activities and why is the government unable to absorb such people when they have so much potential? I think these are issues that do not really require a very philosophical view of things, Lee. I think these are issues that that have a very legal pathway to its conclusion. These are not something that are very deep and it is very simple. Everything is common sense. The reason why our people, especially our youths, are leaving the states to find employment and livelihood in other communities and states is because they don't have opportunities here. I think over the past about 20 years that various government leaders and especially the dispensations that were led by Nifirio have constantly and consistently over time in the assembly during the electionary processes has always, always promised development, employment for the youth. Unfortunately, that is not the case because, um, as you have mentioned just now, our youths, mm -hmm. they do not have jobs here mm -hmm. or maybe their skill sets are skill sets that the industries from outside our states demanded mm -hmm. or maybe that they are overqualified for them or maybe that they don't find the jobs that they can do here or just in general terms, there is, no there is no employment in the state. And it's very easy to see why our youths are going outside. And unfortunately, whatever happened in Gurgaon should actually force our government and our stakeholders to have discussions on instating an employment policy for the state. Unfortunately, we have not heard from the authorities in this regard. I think this should be an occasion for us to plan something for our youth where they can find employment because I think employment right now is one of the biggest governmental statement rules. It's mm -hmm. one of the biggest advertisement promotional mm -hmm. avenues that the government used to further its interests. But the reality is that there is not employment avenues that can observe the skill and the educated industry-wise youths in the state of Nagaland. And that is why our youths are going outside. I think way back uh, in 2021, 
and 22, mm -hmm. uh, the number of the percentage of unemployment in Nagaland, especially among the youth, was reported about 7.8 percent, mm -hmm. and which is one of the highest highest in India. So 7.8 percent is not a joke because do you know what the national average for unemployment countrywide is? Mm -hmm. It's only about 3.2 percent. Mm. Nagaland is 7.8 percent, yes. one of the highest unemployment percentages in India. So I think this should give us an opportunity to really start thinking about uh, engaging the problem at the policy level. Because so far I have not really come across any governmental uh, platforms or schemes that the government might be uh, creating and developing to absorb the skilled youth. Mm. And to be fair, to be fair, it's not like Nagaland has unemployment the way we see it. Mm. So practically, because our youths are not really attuned towards employment avenues and livelihoods that necessarily do not give them the kind of, let's say, packages they want, mm. or the kind of professional dignity that they might want to have. And that's why. Uh, how many in Aga use do you see selling pani puris or chats or setting up pan shops mm -hmm. or working as contract tealer, uh, contract tealers mm. and working as farmers or construction workers mm -hmm. in the state? Mm. So, uh, to be fair, there is no unemployment mm -hmm. in Nagaland the way we see it. Mm. It's just that. We don't have avenues that can absorb skilled youths. Mm. And that is the reason why unemployment mm. uh, in Naglen is not in terms of the lack of unavailability of jobs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Unemployment for us, especially for the educated and skilled youth, mm. is in terms of job avenues that can absorb specific skill sets. Mm. So that is the reason why it's easier for our youth to go outside mm. and look for opportunities there. And unfortunately, like you mentioned, Gurwan was a very bad experience and I do not believe this is the first time. I think way back uh, 80, no, 20, no, way back 2008, 2007, somewhere in that area, uh, there was a report of a, another call center case. Mm -hmm. I think this was in Bunjab mm -hmm. or Haryana somewhere again. So several of our people, our youth were working in that call center. And unfortunately, that company was running a scam mm. and our youth happened to be working there. So if you go outside, the possibility of you finding livelihood is more competitive. Mm -hmm. which means you don't really care about which company you're looking for as long as you get paid for a job that you want to do or willing to take up mm -hmm. then i think that's where you will just just go in because it's a question of desperation for them mm -hmm. you cannot be choosy outside mm -hmm. so um uh, we, we, we can say a lot of stuff in this but yes. mm, it, it is much more complex than just yes. from yes. the government side yeah, uh, sir. I would like to int uh, I would uh, interrupt you and ask you one question. Uh, based on all these discussions that we have been having right now, yes, uh, as you said, the skill set and education these two go hand in hand, and they are very crucial for employment in any sector. But right now, we are aware that the government is trying its best to have workshops to have short-term training courses where uh, let's assume let's uh, not assume but let's say even uh, in the management sector the government is uh, giving out courses to students to train our young minds to get employment but the main problem is that we cannot absorb it how do we tackle that they are being trained but then they are forced to go out and work that is the big question uh, in hand, the big problem is that. Well, if our youths are being trained and there is no avenue in the state for them to exercise those skill sets, then I think it's very natural for them to go outside and find jobs somewhere else. Mm. As simple as that. Mm -hmm. And I do not believe that the state government or the government authorities' job is to train our youths 
which of course is helpful for the youth. I think the whole imperative and the idea of creating uh, an, in, an employment policy for the state is not to train our youth because that will be simply addressing the symptoms of the disease. Mm -hmm. We're not addressing the cause, mm. the disease itself. Yes. So I think it's one way of diverting the people's minds away from the core problem. So, mm. uh, yes, fine, it's, it's great. Let's train all our youths. Let's give them a set of skills that they can use in future employment, great. But I think the problem here is not so much about the scarcity of skill mm -hmm. youths. It's not so much about the scarcity of competences, especially mm. industry skills. Mm. The scarcity is the avenues they can actually exercise those skills. Mm. Uh, there are a lot of people, even in our community, to, in our colony, I was at Fort Mile, a lot mm. of skilled people mm. used, they had been trained in this and that, tailoring, businesses, small businesses, fisheries. They have been trained in computer applications, basic computer uh, applications. Mm. And they were sitting just there because what will you do with skills if there are no avenues? Yes. So that is why I keep saying the solution will not come from the community. The solution will have to come from the government because creating avenues demands uh, demands a governmental framework that will also have to need some kind of a legislative backing for them to create industries, mm -hmm. economic industries. Mm. We cannot just set up a building and say, okay, now we need this and this job, you need revenue. Mm -hmm. So you have to go into a lot of complex network of components for us to actually say, oh, we have an industry, so now this is where we are going to observe our youth. Mm -hmm. So uh, training, yes, let's keep on training our youth give them training mm -hmm. but i think that is just addressing the symptoms mm -hmm. yes so may i ask you uh, this is a, this may be a very controversial topic but we have so many talented nagas who have ventured out in search of jobs in search of better life even outside our land and abroad as well so when they already have uh, this is one thing that like, i really want to ask that when they already are outside and they have witnessed so much, w w can we expect their contribution back as well? Uh, should we always just rely on the government? Because Nagaland, uh, most of the employment is from the government itself. We don't have much uh, private industries or any uh, technology-based companies that are working in Nagaland. But what about the people who have gone outside? What, are the, what about the people who have been successful already? Do they have a big role to play to you know, help your own people? I think that's an unnecessary burden for the people in the sense that no one is obliged to give to the community. Because they're successful, I think it, mm -hmm. as, is, it is unfair to them for us to expect them to give back. Mm -hmm. Whatever they earn, they earn it with their skill sets, mm -hmm. with their hard work, mm -hmm. with their effort, and to believe that to use the context of their success and expect them to come and create industries, okay, fine. Mm -hmm. If you have the money, if you have the earning, the baking, and the industry success that is required for you to build a manufacturing unit or a factory in Nagaland, good. But not everyone is going to be a businessman. Not everyone is going to be successful. And even if they are successful, I'm sure they're giving back to their families and communities. I'm sure they're helping their families, families and relatives. I'm sure they're giving back in that sense. But like I said, I think it's an unnecessary burden that we should be expect, expecting successful mm. Naga people outside to contribute to the state. Mm. Because like I said, this is subjective. If they feel that they need to, because how do we define success? Mm. Now we don't know how, uh, are we going to ask a Naga fashion designer living in Los Angeles who is making three million a month, and just because she's making three million a month, do we expect her to suddenly feel obligated to create industries in Nagaland so that they can absorb our Naga unemployed youth. No, it's not, it's not something they're obligated and I think mm -hmm. it's not really 
uh, polite for us, let mm. me put it that way, yes, to, yes. to be expecting people mm. to, you know, if they want right, why not? Mm. We need it. But that is not something that we should really be imposing on them that because that expectation is just an expression of our own failure to create our own avenues of employment. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, sir, uh, as you might know that we have uh, very uh, successful people as well. But uh, here's the thing that I want to again highlight. Uh, as we know that we have uh, the youth net in Nagaland as well. Youth net who has done a very good job in, uh, uh, in uh, providing jobs to uh, our own people who have studied outside, come back or our own educated youths, the youth net also has uh, done a lot of works. So, are we in need of more associations and you know organizations like this that help in placements of our Nagas or uh, how, how much do we rely on private, uh, private organizations for employment? What, what is the future the government that has to offer? Yeah, I think it's commendable for our community uh, organizations to create some kind of a system where our youth are also not only trained but also find jobs. It wouldn't be for everyone. It will only be for the selected categories, people who, are, who show and demonstrate skill in certain industry areas. So we, which is a great thing and organizations like YouthNet and of course our entrepreneurs associates they have been doing a wonderful job in this regard in trying to train our youths and give them placements but frankly uh, I think we need more than that hmm. because you cannot expect two organizations or three organizations to carry the entire burden of unemployment of an entire state of Nagaland with a people of more than two million. And I think mm. it's unfair to expect all these organizations to carry our burden and our problems in that regard. Mm. So yes, definitely uh, we need the government, we need also the hand of the community mm. to contribute to some kind of a solution. It might not be now, but even in the future too, we, might, we will certainly need a solution in this regard. But mm -hmm. there again, I would like to add here, mm. uh, Lee, is that there has to be a cultural change as well. Mm. A change in the way we look at work, mm -hmm. a change in the way we look at industries and skills. Mm -hmm. uh, in 2007, I did an investigative report and during the time the Chief Secretary of the State of Nagaland was Mr. Lal Tara, mm. who was originally from Mizoram. Mm -hmm. So during the time I was with the Morong Express and we undertook about six months investigative report mm. and during the time we found out, it was in 2007, mm. we found out that uh, the amount of money that non-local migrant labors in Naglin made mm. was to the tune of about four, 400, 478 crore rupee. Mm. And all this was being funneled outside the state. Mm. They come, they earn, they send the money back mm. to the cities. Yes. So the economy was not sustainable. Mm. And the thing is, some of the highest earning sectors for this non-Naga uh, non immigrant labors in Nagaland mm. were that they were not in some blue collar jobs or in, not, in, not in the government service. They were in selling pan masalas, mm. pani puris on the sideways. Mm. It was in the farms looking after Naga farmers' paddy fields. It was in the forest, mm. tending to the cattle. All these unorganized jobs have high returns for them. Mm. And we found out that during that time, I think the number of, I'm not saying legal or illegal, mm. I'm just saying that what we found out that the highest number of this non-Naga labor force were from Indian states, mm. 
Bihar was there, Haryana was there, and then Maharashtra was there, Odisha, mm -hmm. especially Bihar. Mm -hmm. So they were not necessarily illegal immigrants from Bangladesh as we know them, but they were from mainland India and they could come here, earn, and then send back the money to their families or outside. Mm -hmm. So we were losing a lot of revenue. So the whole idea of people like Usenet or Entrepreneurs Associates or the government of Nagaland taking the burden of employment alone, unemployment alone mm -hmm. is not something really practical. Mm. There has to be a mindset shift first. Mm. And why don't we start, we, our Naga youth, start cleaning bathrooms for people. Oh yes, very true. Why don't we now go in into the fields and take care of the cattle and cows and farming? Why don't we start mm. pawn shops? Mm -hmm. Why aren't we the ones doing that? Yes. And if our youth would slowly, slowly, slowly go and take care of these small job sectors, I would call it, mm -hmm. then I think eventually we wouldn't even have the problem of migrant labor force in Nagaland mm -hmm. or illegal migrants in Nagaland. Why do they come in? Because there are, there are jobs for them to have, mm -hmm. jobs we don't do. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's not just communities or civic organizations or even professional organizations like YouthNet helping with the un unemployment issues. Mm. I think the people also need a cultural shift mm. in the way we look at the world, in the way we look at work and industry. Mm. Our outlooks should change. Mm -hmm. We should change. And only then I think it, it can contribute to the work of people like YouthNet mm. or the government of Nagaland. True. Yeah, yes, sir. Sir Al, exactly as you have stated right now, this was a question that I intended to ask you. Actually, in Nagaland, we see that uh, most of the, let's say, the petty jobs, the small jobs mm. that are being done by the outsiders mm. in Nagaland. So, uh, as you said, they need, there needs to be a shift of mindset, a shift of culture. But uh, where do we, how do we uh, identify the problem? Is it the high level of education that our people have that they feel like, no, we are not, uh, we should not do this kind of job. I'm graduate. I shouldn't be doing all these kind of things. What is the problem? Can we pinpoint the problem? I think a very large part of the blame will have to go to our parents. And I'm not saying they're solely responsible for what is happening in the state of Nagaland and our community. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that the way we look at the world, our cultural outlook about conve conventional uh, livelihood was not the way we should be actually having. Our parents told us that in order, to be, in order for you to be respected, you need to be a doctor or an engineer. Mm -hmm. You should be an SDO, DC. Mm -hmm. You should be a you know, government official. Mm. for you to start earning, for you to gain respect. Mm. And I think that is at the heart of the way we look at the world, mm. which indirectly affected the first generations to start thinking, oh, mm. if I don't become a government officer or a mm. government employee, then I'm not going to earn anything in my life. I'm not going to earn the respect of the people. Mm. So that is, I think, where it started for our generation, the third generation professionals. So it's only now that our youths are thinking about fashion designing. Mm. They're thinking about entrepreneurship and businesses. Mm. They want to start their own factories. Mm. So the chief is changing only in this age, mm. in our generation, mm. which is a good thing. And I think we should continue to do so because Employment at the industrial policy level of the state government is a long time in the coming. It's not yet. Mm -hmm. It's going to take a lot of years yes. for us to come S up Sir and create some kind of uh, system where our youths are employed profitably. Yes. Sir El, uh, we are running out of time, but to summarize our discussion on the ultimate topic, why are youths are seeking jobs outside? To summarize that, how how do you think we should move ahead and what are the things what are the things that you believe that can be done and should be done so that our young minds our young innovative minds stay in the state how would you like to summarize our conversation yeah i think first thing uh, the state government of nagaland really needs to start thinking about 
employment policy at a policy level. Mm -hmm. First thing, I think it really needs to start talking about a policy for the state of Nagaland mm. that can be implemented and at a legislative level. For the community, I think we should start encouraging our youngsters to let them choose whatever they want to do. Mm. If they want to go into fashion designing, why not? But stop forcing them to find government jobs. Of course, it offers security and that's the only avenue for them right now to find some kind of a livelihood security. Mm. But that's not enough. Just encourage them. Let them, you know, encourage them. Tell them that no matter what jobs they do, it is not the wrong thing. It's a good thing as long as they're moving forward. Okay, sir. Thank you so much for your input. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, that is all we have for now in this newsroom discussion. For more news and updates, keep watching Hornbill TV.